Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying good morning because it's uh, uh, just eight o'clock in the morning here in on the west coast of Canada. I'm sure it's uh, uh, late afternoon or so in Nigeria and South Africa. So in any event, uh, uh, just a very brief introduction of myself. I'm a co-founder of uh, AOTIC as well as the founding uh, chairman of uh, AOTIC, the, the AOTIC Hematology Oncology Research Group. And it is my uh, honor and pleasure to chair this session today. So I would like to start off uh, with this uh, slide here. First of all, I would like to express my appreciation again to uh, AstraZeneca for hosting us on their uh, media. Uh, this is a, a great service being rendered to AOTIC because uh, uh, it actually helps in uh, highlighting and promoting uh, the activities of uh, aortic Chalk, the uh, aortic hematology oncology research group i also would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, mrs Belmira, uh rodrick and miss uh, sky wilson uh, of the uh, aortic office in cape town for all they're doing in uh, promoting these webinar sessions um, now, let's see, I think I need to go back here. Okay. Now, uh, this is the second in the Yoti uh, Chalk webinar series, uh, uh, by which we are reviewing a research protocol on the management of acute lymphoblastic leukemia in Nigerian children and young adults. Today, we would have three presentations, hope, hopefully it, uh, three pre presentations, uh, assuming that Dr. Brown would uh, join us uh, as soon as possible. Each presentation would last 30 minutes. And uh, I would like to uh, appeal to each presenter to uh, kindly limit their presentation to 30 minutes each. Uh, after each presentation, we would endeavor to have uh, uh, questions for a few minutes. However, after all the three presentations that would have been uh, made uh, over a period of one and a half hours, we will still have about 30 minutes uh, before the closure of this session uh, to be able to have additional uh, uh, question and answer session. Uh, uh, if we have uh, 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 enough questions to address. Uh, so the entire session is planned for a two hour uh, duration. Now for the uh, audience out there in uh, Zoom land, you could uh, uh, give us your questions in writing uh, in the uh, Q&A bubble uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the Zoom uh, 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 linkage. So I would, with that, I would want to uh, get the, the session moving with the presentation of Brown is a professor of uh, pediatrics uh, at the uh, University of Ibadan. He uh, graduated from that university, uh, and after which uh, he became a fellow of the West African College of uh, Physicians in Pediatrics. Uh, he also holds a master's degree in epidemiology and medical stat statistics and he rose to the rank of a professor at the University of Ibadan in 2016. And he is the head of the Pediatric Hematology and Oncology uh, Unit of the Department of 
pediatrics of the teaching hospital in Ibadan. He's uh, the secretary of the Nigerian Society of Pediatric Oncology, uh, and he's a member of the International Society of uh, Pediatric Oncology, CIAP. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Professor Brown to make his presentation, uh, which is titled Treatment Protocol for Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia in Nigerian Children and Young Adults on the Age 30 Laboratory Investigations. Professor Brown. Please take it on. Uh, I'm going to uh, come out and uh, you can, uh, now let's see. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? I can hear you very well. Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Right, so thank you. So I am to present the investigations Actually, not the treatment protocol, just the investigations. And I think Dr. Adefain is to take the treatment um, for the proposed protocol for acute lymphoblastic leukemia in Nigerian children and young adults under the age of 30. And as Professor Williams has said, I work in Ibadan. Now, by way of introduction, acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a potentially curable hematological cancer. In Caucasians, there is durable remission in over 80% of children with standard risk disease. ALL in Nigeria has been characterized by poor treatment outcomes and low remission rates and short disease-free survival. The reported incidence of ALL is much lower in Nigeria at 0 0.8 um, compared to the incidence of between 2.46 among Caucasians and 1.26 in American Black. Now, we are not sure how accurate this data is because of the challenges we have in terms of data um, cancer registry and good um, data keeping. Well, that is just the estimates. And so it is believed that ALL is lower here than among the Caucasians. Now, the objective of this study is to use a tested regimen um, that was modified from the, the MCP 841 protocol that has been used for over 20 years with excellent results in India, a resource-constrained country like most of Africa. The protocol was adopted and modified by the BFM-90 regimen, which is more suitable for the predominantly high-risk ALL cases seen in Nigeria, and it is cost-effective with acceptable toxicity. We all know the challenge we have here is support for toxicity in terms of blood products and um, growth factors. So this protocol being proposed has, is cost effective and also has acceptable toxicity that can be managed within our country. So what are the objectives of this presentation? I divided them into investigations, at diagnosis or for diagnosis, and then pre-commencement of treatments, during treatment, and during follow-up. So for diagnosis, what is required, what I'm proposing is complete blood count, including the hemoglobin, hematocrits, platelet counts, and detailed examination of peripheral blood film and the pressure cell counts. In this situation, we'll be checking out for presence of blasts in peripheral fin. Now, to confirm the diagnosis, a bone marrow aspiration will be done. And this, the blasts being greater than 25% would 
claim the diagnosis of, or we confirm the diagnosis of acute infoblastic leukemia. In terms of cytochemistry, I'm hoping to test for PAS, myeloperoxidase, and Sudan Black B. And in terms of cytogenetic analysis and molecular analysis, I'm hoping that at least the BCR and ABL1 fusion gene will be tested for. Now, for immunophenotyping using flu cytometry, the leukemic cells will be evaluated with the following primary antibodies for CD3, CD2, CD10, CD19, CD20, CD22, and CD34, and 45, CD79A, and HLADR, and TDT. A positive immunophenotype refers to a CD of or of 20% or more for the, for the particular um, CD type type. Positive T, T cell ALL is defined as two or more T cell markers, that is CD1 to CD8. And common ALL is the expression of CD10, CD19, or CD20. Precursor B ALL defines it be defined as expression of CD19 or CD20 but negative CD10. While mature B ALL, that is we will be um, patients that have erythrium morphology with CD10, CD19, CD20, and then so um so hemoglobin plus and expression of the clonal Kappa or lambda genes. Now, so that is for establishment of the diagnosis of ALL. Now, the pre-treatment workup of these patients include the following: the serum E and U, and nitrogen and creatinine, the hepatic panel and liver function tests that will include alkaline phosphatase. Serum amino trans um, transaminases, AST and ALT, and total bilirubin and serum protein and albumin. We also would like to do the serum lactic acid dehydrogenase, serum uric acid, calcium and phosphates. And then for the mineral panel, we're including calcium phosphorus and magnesium. And then for the coagulation panel, we're using the P um, PT and APTT and fibrinogen. Also, as part of the pre-treatment workup of patients, we will do the hepatitis screening, hepatitis B service antigen, and antibodies to hepatitis C. We will also be testing for HIV 1 and 2 antibody screening, and then the blood group and hemoglobin and electrophoresis. Routine analysis will also be done, and in this situation, we're checking for the pH of the urine, specific gravity, protein, sugar, and blood. And then for females of childbearing age, and when indicated, pregnancy test will be done. And because of the need for anthracyclines, which we know are cardiotoxic drugs, ECG and echocardiogram, will be needed for this group of patients, for all the patients that will follow our protocol. With regards to the imaging studies, we are focusing on doing chest x-ray, and in which case, a mediastinal mass will be expected to be seen in patients with T-cell ALL, or presence of a mediastinal mass will suggest the, the T-cell ALL. And then we also hope to do abdominal pelvic ultrasound scan. TSF exam will also be done, and this will be evaluated for with the first intrathecal therapy. It will be evaluated for cell count, the CSF cytology, protein, and glucose. And that will classify the patients into the three CNS categories. With CNS1, 
ref in referring to WBC or less than five and no blasts in a non tra traumatic lumbar puncture. CNS2 is also for a non traumatic lumbar puncture, CSF or less than five CM, five per microliter with, with identifiable blasts on site to centrifuge. And CNS3 will be CSF of greater than five cells per microliter, also with identifiable blast cells on site, site to centrifuge. Now the investigation to be done during chemotherapy. Treatment, just for, to, to guide us as to the investigations, you need some summary of what the treatment involves. Now the treatment involves three successive remission induction therapies, which will be one, two A, two B, and a repeat of one then remission consolidation and remission maintenance with the entire treatment lasting for 96 weeks, which is approximately um, two years. The remission induction will be done within 20 weeks, consolidation within four weeks, and the maintenance, um, 72 and 96 weeks respectively, 72 weeks for the B cell types and 96 weeks for the T cell lineage ALL. Now the summary of the chemo. In the induction, the first induction will be preceded by a seven-day pre-induction phase. And it involves just administration of prednisolone monotherapy. Other components of the first induction will continue from the eight. After re-evaluation, of referral blood lymphoblast count for determination of risk certification. Patients who have referral blood blasts less than a thousand cells per microliter will be classified as low risk, and those with higher um, blast count classified as high risk. In the induction 2A, which follows immediately after, and then induction 2B, and then you have the repeat of the, the first induction. Then the next phase will be a one month cycle of consolidation therapy that shall be given after the induction 2B. And then the definitive treatment will end with maintenance therapy. of more than a thousand cells per liter and platelet count of more than um, 75, more than, of more than um, 750 um, cells per, more than 75,000 per liter. So with those, then the, the next phase can continue. Now, investigations to assess the response during treatment for this one to seven, which is pre-induction, and after a woman marrow is done, a peripheral blood film is done, and that it classifies the patient into low risk or, or high risk, and that is done on the eighth, that is immediately after the pre-induction, the peripheral blood he is done to, to stratify the patients into risk categories. After which the induction one proper continues and, and, and runs to an end. So on the 15 of induction one, response assessment will be evaluated with quantitative and morphologic changes before the induction cycle two. At the end of induction one, the referral blood film blood count will be done, and the percentage of blasts also will be assessed. And bone marrow will also be assessed, bone marrow cytology will be assessed for remission status using the percentage of blasts. Cytospin of the CSF for leukemic cells will also be carried out with each intrathecal therapy 
and then on day 29, the bone marrow to be assessed for confirmation of remission status. The cytospin for CSF will also be evaluated for leukemic cells, which each intrathecal therapy, just as it was at the end of induction one. Now, investigations for the various phases of chemotherapy. Actually, in the in the in the current um, the latest version of this proposed um, protocol, the time frequencies or intervals or the specific times for these investigations are not specified. So I just use my discretion and I reviewed the professor Drew me to um, state at least certain basic minimum that should be done. We know that during treatment phase, there will be complications. And sometimes we need more investigations than you anticipate based on um, toxicity that is observed. So here, during induction, in addition to the immunological tests for assessing response, we need to do the E and U creatinine, calcium, phosphorus, and uric acid because of the risk of tumor lysis syndrome in these patients. And then during <coughs> consolidation, we will require weekly full blood count and the same as well as the tumor lysis syndrome panel, E and U creatinine, uric acid, and all that. But the exact, at least weekly, but the exact frequency will depend on the patient response and toxicities observed. Now, during maintenance therapy, in week <coughs> one, we are proposing FBC thrice a week, and then serum with the rubin once also a week. And then from weeks two to 12, we are proposing monthly full blood counts, EIU, creatinine, and the rest of the TLS panel during the maintenance Therapy. Like I said, these are not the, the, the exact timing for these are not in the latest version of the uh, protocol. So they are subject to review. Where these are just based on my experience with some other protocols, right? And keeping in mind also the cost implications in terms of funding. For definition of complete remission. This we define as patients who have peripheral blood and with neutrophils over a thousand cells per liter of blood, platelet count of over 75,000 per liter, and then the absence of blood cells and the normal bone marrow examination with blood cells of 5% of less or less. Complete resolution of all extramedullary disease. So peripheral lymphadenopathy should have resolved, splenomegaly should have resolved, hepatomegaly should have resolved, and there should be no blood cells in ESF. Following induction one, all other circles are given as soon as the neutrophils and platelet count meet the criteria that have already been specified. Now, during follow-up, after completion of treatment, this also is not clearly stated in the latest version of the proposal, but they are proposing that um, patients will be followed up for five years from the date of initi initiation of induction therapy. That is in the protocol. But <clears throat> and then the period of protocol uh, or chemo last two years, they are proposing three monthly full blood count for the first year, and then six monthly full blood count for the subsequent two years. I said this is subject to, to review. Disease relapse <clears throat> is defined as presence of blasts in excess, in excess of 25% in the bone marrow or presence of histologically or cytologically confirmed extramedullary leukemia that is in the CSF <clears throat> or testicle after the achievement of complete remission. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Brown. Uh, 
Uh, that was a very, very good presentation. Very lucid, very clear, and very detailed. I, I very much appreciate it. Now, let's see. Uh, I don't see anybody uh, putting down, uh, putting in any questions at this time. And I don't see any questions here. Uh, but I think we have uh, some time. I, if I may, I just have a few comments. Uh, now, uh, the, the incidence of uh, 0 0.8 uh, of, uh, as, as uh, the incidence of acute lymphoblastic leukemia in, in Nigeria, as you very well know, is, uh, is from my own study when I was in the bathroom. And that's, that's a long time ago. Long time ago. Yes, uh, and that's number one. Number two, uh, it, it applies only to the city of Ibadan. Yes, sir. And, uh, and so it, it cannot even be said to be for the whole of Nigeria. Yeah. And, uh, and this is why I'm so excited about your study, about this study that you are uh, planning to do. Uh, now, uh, do you think that you would be able to estimate or to determine the incidence of acute lymphoplastic leukemia, including the various subtypes uh, from the data that you are likely to collect from this study? And how do you think that you'll be able to do that? Yes, thank you very much, sir. So I think we will be able to make an estimate. Now, recently, at least from this study. Like you said, all you are quoting is the, the work you did so many years ago while you are here. Now, recently, the Ibadan Cancer Registry produced a book um, for incidence of cancer in, in, in Ibadan and the, in, in, in Nigeria. And <clears throat> incidentally, they excluded the pediatric cases completely. Mm. So I got to see the, the, the book and I and I I discussed with the head of the Office of Pathology who admitted the omission and said subsequently it will be included. Okay. Now a few years ago we also had this um cancer program in, in Abuja, the, the Nigerian Cancer Control Program for I think it's supposed to be for within 2018 to 2022 or so. Again, the figures for children we are absent and we raised the issue with them as, as well they only give us figures there for adults so I, i'm hoping that from our study this gap that is lacking focusing essentially on adults and not on children this 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 study will give us better figures for both children and adults under the age of 30 years that's one strong point i think this study has thank you sir Okay, that's a very good uh, answer. The other thing is uh, the, the problem we had, uh, uh, or that I had when I was in the Baton in the 80s, uh, there hadn't been any uh, census for almost 20 years. So we didn't have any idea about how many people were in, in, uh, in the Baton or in, in the country. <clears throat> Now, fortunately, my wife was uh, a consultant at, the, uh, at NISA, the Nigerian Institute for Social uh, and Economic Research. And uh, she was able to help me uh, to get some information uh, on, uh, through which we were able to project uh, from the most uh, recent uh, census data at that time, which was about 20 years earlier. And we were able to uh, have a rough estimate of the population of uh, uh, subgroups of people uh, in Ibadan City. Uh, I would be wondering how you would be able to use such uh, data in determining the incidence of the disease I, I know about this time. I, I don't know when last a, a reliable uh, census was carried out in Nigeria. Thank you very much, sir. The last census in Nigeria was in the year 2006. Okay. And that census was very, very detailed and exhaustive. 
Okay. It included the age, you know, the population at various age categories. Now, it was supposed to be done every 10 years. So in 2016, we were to have another census. It was not held. And up to now, we don't have anything new. So all we have now is a census figures that is 14 years old. But what happened is based on that 20, 2016 census, every year, based on the population growth rate uh, and the federal official statistics, they give us a projected or an estimated population of the country. Incidentally, yeah. Yeah. all these estimated or projected populations, are, the figures given to us are mainly total population. The breakdown into different age categories is usually not included or not detailed in the projected um, census from the 2006. That is the main challenge that we have. But since we had a federal office of statistics, if we need the figure based on the age, at age brackets we had then, and because the life expectancy has not really changed significantly, it may be possible for some statisticians to be able to project using those veggies. Certainly, it will not be as accurate as it would have been if we had a 2016 census, which we are supposed to have had but failed to conduct. Thank you, sir. Very, very good. Now, just the last uh, uh, question. Uh, how Could you provide uh, uh, some details as to how you intend to carry out the, the immunophenotypic characterization of the uh, uh, leukemia population? Well, we have, the, the truth is that we have had some people, even in Ibadan, some have been sent abroad to the years before for training for those cytometry and immunophenotyping. We also have in the, um, at the IMRAT, the Institute of Advanced Medical Research and Training, they have some um, facilities there, but the antibody panels are very limited. Mm. So, Based on what we have, we have some people that have been trained. We have Dr. Lani, who is also in our program. Dr. Lani has been trained, but you see, having not used it, this training for, so, for, for a long time, it may require some retraining. But we also have um, the... So, well, I don't think, I don't think it, should, it should be so difficult. Having had the experience, you have been trained before, you have some refresher to be able to... Um, do the immunophenotyping to give us accurate answers as long as we have the adequate antibody panels. Very good, very good. So, so what, uh, you would not be going to wait, you wouldn't wait for the Acura uh, cyt uh, cytometer, uh, no. or are you going to use indirect, uh, uh, I mean, uh, microscopy or something like that? So what, what, what are your plans? Well, the, the basic things we do so far, at least here as at this time point in time, is just morphology using microscopy. We are unable to do um, the immunophenotyping. Some private laboratories can do it, but they send our samples to, to, to South Africa. We right. also have, I think, one or two labs in Enugu, somewhere in Enugu, in Enugu that can do for us as well, but um, is very very expensive. So yeah. are, that is the, that's a challenge. Very good. I'm not sure oh. of how much facilities are available in Ife. Professor Drosimi may be able, or Dr. Ife, he may be able to put in one or two words in terms yeah. of facilities they have at Ife okay. for in the phenotyping for the study. Okay, so very good. Hopefully, we will be able to get uh, you know uh, some cytometer, and then we'll go from there. Again, thank you very, very, very much for a very uh, excellent presentation. Now we'll go on to the next uh, uh, presentation, and that is going to be by Dr. Olufemi Adifenti. Uh, Dr. Adifenti is a graduate uh, of uh, the Obafemi Awolowo University. Uh, where he also did his uh, residency uh, uh, in pediatrics. He's a fellow of the West African College of Physicians, uh, 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 I believe in pediatrics. 
and uh, had a, a postgraduate uh, training at the Tata Memorial Hospital of Mumbai, India, um, where he specialized uh, in pediatric oncology. Uh, and he subsequently uh, returned to Nigeria to the Obafemi Awolowo uh, Teaching Hospital complex, uh, where he pioneered the establishment of pediatric oncology unit and pediatric on oncology outpatient clinic at the hospital. Uh, he's a senior lecturer at the Department of Pediatric uh, at the Department of Pediatrics at the University of, of uh, out, uh, Ife, sorry, for the old Ife, it's now Obafemi Awolo University. And um, so with that, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Adifainti to please make his presentation, which is going to be titled Treatment Protocol for Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia in Nigerian Children and Young Adults under age 30 years, Medication and Clinical Experience. Dr. Adifainti, please take it over. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank the organizers of the program and the chairman of the program. I also want to thank Professor Brown for that presentation. He has actually made my job a little bit easier. I will be going straight away to discuss the medications and clinical experience we have in Nobafem Yawolowo University Teaching Hospital based on this protocol. Concerning the medication, I'll be talking about the drugs and the administration and the schedule of the regimen. And briefly, we discuss at the end of that the clinical experience. I would like to say that this protocol, as said earlier, is, is adopted from Indian MCP 841 protocol and German Berlin Frankfurt Monster BFM 90 protocol. All the, the youth are from the WHO list of essential and cancer drugs. They include prednisolone, dexamethasone, vincristine, cytarabine, doxorubicin or donorubicin, as the case may be, cyclophosphamide, cis macatopurine, L asparaginase, and metotrexate. In this current protocol, there is no cranial radiotherapy because facilities are not widely available in the in our system. And the treatment phases, we include remission induction phase, remission consolidation phase, and remission maintenance phase, as earlier highlighted. The remission induction will last 20 weeks. And these will include induction one, induction two A, induction two B, repeat of induction one, before we move on to remission consolidation and remission maintenance as stated earlier. Now, Starting with remission induction one. <coughs> the three phase that will last one week. That is pre-induction phase using prednisolone monotherapy at a dose of 60 milligrams per meter squared. And the essence of this is to be able to risk stratify them into prednisolone responsiveness and not prednisolone responsiveness group. For those that respond to prednisolone, based on the criteria that was highlighted earlier by Professor Brown, they will, be, they will either be standard risk or intermediate risk based on other criteria, which has been highlighted in the first section of this presentation about a month ago. For those that are not prednisolone responders, automatically they are risk stratified to the high risk group. And starting from day 28 of that phase, we start the intermediate and the standard risk group on prednisolone at the dose of 40 mg per meter squared, the 8 to 28, while we switch the high risk group to the examethasone at the dose of 0, I mean 6.6 mg per meter squared, the 8 to 28. Other drugs in that phase include vincristine at <coughs> 1 per meter squared, four doses in all, the 8, the 15, the 22, and the 29. L asparaginase at the dose of 6,000 international units per meter squared, 
subcutaneously, 10 doses in all, starting from the 8th to the 26th, giving alternate days. Then we have doxorubicin or donorubicin. Doxo at the dose of 20 milligram, why dono at the dose of 30 milligram per meter square, three doses in all for the induction phase, giving the 8th, the 15th, and the 29th. Metrotrexate prophylaxis will be given intrathecally. For those that are standard risk and intermediate risk, at depending on the age, there is actually a table at the end of this slide, at the end of the presentation, to show the age group and the doses for the prednisolone. For those that fall within standard risk and intermediate risk, metrotrexate alone will be given. Five doses, in, four doses in all, the 8th, the 15th, the 22, and 29. Why triple intrathecal therapy will be given to the high risk arm? And this will consist cytarabin, metotrexate, and hydrocortisone, or the examiners on depending <laughs> on the response of the patient. After that, we will work them up based on what Professor Brown has presented. And once the counts are within normal limit of this protocol, we will switch them and with the patient we move on to remission in Dr. Two. And the drugs to be given include cyclophosphamide at the dose of 750 milligrams per meter squared, the 1 and 15, or racis macatopurin, 60 milligrams per meter squared, the 1 to 28. Now, for the intermediate and the standard risk group, we give cytarabine at the dose of 75 milligrams per meter squared, intravenously, the 1 to 4, the 8 to 11, the 15 to 20. To 18 and day 22 to day 24, I mean 25. But for the high risk group, we have decided to give cytarabine at a dose of one gram per meter squared. I think this was discussed extensively in our last meeting. And this will be given 12 hourly on the day one, day 15, day 29. Uh, the reason for this, we could have gone higher. But the cost of a GCSF to rescue the marrow, we think we add extra body to this treatment protocol. And so we, been, we want to limit cost, so to say. And at the same time, we want to give uh, drugs that we, uh, that we are, still give us an achievable result, I mean, a, a good result, durable remission. So we've decided to give Cytarabin at the dose of one gram per meter squared. This we have tested and we know that we are comfortable with it, with minimal our side effects and tolerable toxicity. Of course, we are going to add metotrexate along intrathecally as highlighted in induction one. Then the next phase will be remission induction 2B. This will last eight weeks, two months. And the drugs to be given. We also include cyclophosphamide, 750 milligrams per meter squared, the 1 and the 15, or acid macatopurin, though with a, we step down the dose now to 25 milligrams per meter squared as against the previous one, because the duration for this one is longer, the 1 to 56. Metotrexate will be given, starting with a 100 milligrams per meter squared dose, and then we escalate by 50 milligrams per meter squared up to five doses. This is the Cabizi metotrexate regimen. We could have as well uh, add high dose metotrexate, but for our limitations. One, monitoring metotrexate level is, possible, is practically impossible in our setting. And the complication that can follow, as well as the renal failure, which we also add a body to managing patients. So we've decided to use Cabizi metotrexate regimen, which is tolerable and with minimal or no toxicity. And this will be given to all the group, standard, intermediate, and high risk. And of course, we give prophylaxis, metotrexate, or triple uh, regimen intrathecally, as the case may be standard risk, intermediate, or high risk. After the end of induction 2B, we plan to repeat induction 1. The only difference in this phase is the prednisolone preface. Otherwise, all treatment remains the same as induction one. It's only prednisolone that is missing as a single preface from day one to eight, from day one to seven. 
Next with the consolidation, which is scheduled to be one month. And the drugs that we plan to give include cytarabine at a dose of 100 mg per meter squared subcutaneously 12 hourly, the 1 to 3, and the 15 to 17. The increasing 1.4 mg per meter squared intravenously, the 1 and the 15. Cyclophosphamide at the dose of 750 mg per meter squared intravenously, the 1. Oral cismacatopurin at the dose of 75 mg per meter squared, the 1 to 7 and the 15 to 21. Doxo or donorubicin will also be given uh, on day 15, and met, I mean, metrotrexate, intratecale, and say, uh, triple intratecal regimen too, depending on the risk category. At the end of the consolidation phase, we plan to give maintenance therapy that will last 18 months in all. And each, that will be total of six cycles. Each cycle will last 12 weeks. But there is something we've decided to do in this maintenance phase. The first one week, we decided to give a mini induction regimen just to intensify the treatment protocol. Since we could not go beyond one gram per meter squared, especially for the high risk group in, of cytarabine, and since we are not giving high dose metrotrexate, so we decided to give a mini induction regimen for the first one week. And this includes prednisolone of 40 mg per meter squared or dexamethasone 6 mg per meter squared, day 1 to 7. The increasing 1.4 mg per meter squared intravenously, day 1. Doxo or donorubicin, 20 or 30 mg per meter squared intravenously, day 1. And then we also give L asparaginase, 60,000 international units per meter squared subcutaneously, day 1, the 3, the 5, and the 7 alternately, you know, doses for four doses. We allow patients to rest for one week. Uh, starting from day 14, patient will now start oral metotrexate at the dose of 50 mg per meter squared weekly for the rest of the weeks, I mean, of the cycle. And then oral cismacatopurin, 75 mg per meter squared daily for the rest of the cycle. And this is the table showing the age adjusted drug dosage for intrathecal therapy for <coughs> less than two years of age. Metotrexate will be given at a dose of 8 mg, cytarabine at a dose of 35 mg, hydrocortisone at a dose of 20 mg per meter squared. For age greater than 2 but less than 3 years, metotrexate at a dose of 10 mg, cytarabine 40 mg, and hydrocortisone, same dose, 20 mg per meter squared. Greater than 3 years of age, we give metotrexate at a dose of 12 mg, and cytarabine at a dose of 50 mg, while hydrocortisone remains same, 20 mg per meter squared. And that is the protocol for these studies as designed by the group. I will quickly move on to our clinical experience with this regimen that I just presented. Uh, we have a total of uh, 43 patients recruited you know, that participated in this or that we use this regimen on. And we look into their social economic status. Out of the 43 patients that we enrolled, it's surprising that half of them belong to the low socioeconomic class. And that simply means that getting this treatment, getting treatment is a big challenge for this group. Because the majority of them, at the end of making diagnosis, they practically withdraw without any therapy. And of course, we all know the implication of that. Then we also look at the accessibility to national health insurance coverage, I mean, health insurance scheme. Currently, the national health insurance scheme in the country, is uh, uh, the accessibility is still very low, except for the federal government staffs. Virtually no state is really operating <coughs> national insurance policy for now, more so for children. And looking at that, we discovered that only 11 out of the 43 patients were able to access a national health insurance scheme. And of these 11, one of them actually comes from the low socioeconomic class. And this individual, actually the father, is an attendant, a cleaner, in one of the federal government uh, parastatas. That was why 
that family was privileged to access national health insurance. Otherwise, all our low socioeconomic group would have been uh, could, could not have accessed uh, the national health insurance scheme at all. Now, just like what I just said, looking at this table, we discovered that about half or more than half, they are about 51.2%, actually withdrawn before therapy. Out of that 32, 14 of these patients discharged against medical advice without any therapy, whether prednisolone, preface or not. And the reason is no money, no finance. After you made your diagnosis, you cancel, you discuss about the treatment, uh, treatment regimen, the cost implication, the duration of treatment, which we normally do routinely to all patients, whether leukemia, whether other malignancy. We have a team that counsel in our unit, headed by myself, the most senior nurses and the residents and other nursing staff. We discovered that 14 out of the 22 that we drew before therapy, dama without any form of treatment. Theory died before treatment. In other words, after we, I mean, after we made our diagnosis, before we could start treatment, three of these patients died. And only five I mean, had prednisolone preface before the, the charge against medical therapy, before the dama. So bringing the total number of withdrawn cases to 22 of all the 43 patients. So we, are, we were left with 21 and released. And uh, out of this, we risk stratify them based on the earlier criteria that have been presented. We discovered that 71.4% of those 21 belong to the high risk category. In fact, we have a pH positive among this category. Of, I mean, we have about six or seven patients that are Philadelphia chromosome positive among this high risk group. Though that was not the only criteria or <clears throat> that was used, we have other. You know, that was not the only criterion that was used. We have other criteria, but just to lay an emphasis on the importance of the risk group we have in our own setting. Then looking at the outcome of these 21 patients that were treated, we have achieved complete remission at the end of induction one in 81% of them. No response in two, and we have induction mortality of a two bringing induction uh, mortality to 9.5%. Now, our observation or comments based on this short uh, analysis. Survivor study as calculator cannot be reliable because of the high default rate and the very small numbers. However, like I said, 17 which accounted for 81% of the patients that were treated, that received treatment achieved complete remission with this protocol that I've just presented. And uh, out of those with complete remission, the 17, the analysis is as stated below. Seven of them died after a median survival of 59 weeks. Seven of them defaulted after a median follow-up and survival of 23.4 weeks. And we have theory that are still alive up to the time of presentation with a median survival of 337 weeks. Now that 81% of the largely high risk group achieved complete remission after the induction one therapy, we suggest an effective protocol, at least in our own setting. Unfortunately, most of the patients could not afford the cost of therapy on their own, as presented. More than half could not assess therapy at all. Evidently, the protocol cannot be managed without heavy support from government or people assessing health insurance uh, uh, scheme. Regrettably, like I said, the National Health Insurance Scheme has not been helping in our setting. Only few that belong to the federal uh, workers, the federal workers that can assess National Health Insurance Scheme as of today in Nigeria. I want to appreciate the OHAC PLA Research Group from Pediatric and also the University College of Hospital Ibadan. Uh, pediatrics and child health department and the hematology department, Dr. Professor Brown, Professor Adeodu, the resident staff at the nursing, and uh, Dr. Bola Rewa, Dr. Fashola Oladei, Professor Bruce Smith, and also the resident staff. 
of the hematology department and the nursing staff. I thank you all for this point. So your presentation has been very, very, uh, been very uh, informative. I think there is a question here. Let me just try to get hold of it. It says, uh, this is from uh, uh, an individual, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I believe Dr. Johnson, uh, who says, well done, uh, Dr. Adifainty, uh, for a nice presentation, which I very much agree with. And, uh, it's been asked uh, uh, why drugs are not measured in terms of body weight instead of age, uh, since age of some children might not be proportionate to their respective weight. Oh, the meter squared is actually the body uh, mass index, the body mass index. Right, okay. Okay, I, I agree with you. If, if, more, if what you are using is body soft, you know, uh, uh, BSA, body uh, surface area, that is the appropriate index. Which is more reliable than the, absolutely, than the weight. Because absolutely. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a standard all over the world. Yeah, PSA. Okay. Now, uh, I don't see any other questions. If you don't mind, I would just like to make a few comments. Um, I believe that lack of uh, cranial irradiation in this study is actually uh, uh, a potential opportunity uh, for this study to make an impact on global uh, management of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, because we now know that cranial irradiation, uh, you know, has been associated with a number of uh, unpleasant complications. So well, hopefully uh, the use of high dose uh, cytosine arabinoside in combination with intrathecal uh, medication, including uh, uh, metotrexate, uh, uh, cytosine arabinoside, and maybe uh, uh, some steroids as to plan in, uh, in the triple uh, therapy uh, might bring about uh, some new observations in uh, the degree of control of CNS uh, disease in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. That could be of uh, potentially uh, of a significant global in impact. The other thing I would like to talk about is uh, your comment about access to care uh, and the variation, uh, you know, in the various socioeconomic uh, groups. Uh, that makes me very, very sad indeed. I was very, very fortunate when I was practicing in Ibadan in the 80s. That kind of problem did not arise. Everybody had access to care. And uh, there was no question, there was no insurance or anything. Everybody had treatment. As a matter of fact, when I got to Ibadan in 1978, I was able to do, uh, to treat people with uh, innovative therapy that I could not have been able to do when I was in New York, where I came from. Uh, so uh, things unfortunately appear to be going backwards uh, in Africa. And uh, I, I think the, 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 uh, this actually, uh, increases the need for this kind of research that we're trying to do. Hopefully we would be able to find the money uh, so that everybody would be able to have access to care on this, uh, at least in the uh, uh, research setting. And that hopefully would uh, 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 encourage a government to consider funding uh, care for children with cancer. Uh, okay, I think uh, I don't see any other questions. I guess we would just we'll now move on to the final presentation, which is going to be uh, given by Professor uh, Durosimi. Uh, um, now, I've known Dr. Uh, uh, Durosimi for a long time. 
And uh, so just a very brief uh, introduction. He, he is a very accomplished uh, uh, academic physician and uh, we, we should all be very proud of him. He is a graduate uh, of uh, the University of Ibadna in Nigeria. He has been the Dean of the Faculty of uh, Basic Medical Science of his university, which is the above me, Wulawa University. Yeah. And, uh, and he also served as a, a vice chancellor uh, of uh, a university at, uh, uh, in Lagos. Uh, Anyway, I, I can go on and on. He's a very accomplished person and we're very happy to have him. So I would want to call on uh, Professor Grossman to please give us the final presentation, which is going to be titled Treatment Protocol for Acute Level Plastic Leukemia in Nigerian Children and Young Adults under age 30 years, justification and budget. Professor Drosimi, please take it on. Uh, good evening, everybody, everyone. So I'm discussing the justification of the budget of this proposal. Although childhood acute and adolescent acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a potentially curable hematologic disease in the technologically advanced richer populations. Treatment outcome in sub-Saharan Africa, even in this century, remains very discouraging at all levels. The inherent adverse prognostic features of the disease in our population, including hyperleukocytosis, older age of affected children, Philadelphia chromosome positive disease, color negative in a majority of them, higher percentage of T cell ALL are insufficient to explain the poorer response of our patients. In that it has been shown that black children in USA with similar high risk factors, but treated with risk-directed anti-leukemic therapy, did as well as the white children in the same population. The estimated cost of this project is $648,000, comprising essentially of the clinical trial itself, that is $580,000. Then we have medications, which takes 70, about 71%. Equipment, 8.9%. Hospitalization, 16.2%. Investigations, 4.2%. So we also requested for funding for meetings and sundry expenses, just very few. Institutional charges will cost $57,000. The estimated cost of the trial, the challenge, cost per patient is to about 2 million Nigerian currency, which is $5,256 from pre-phase all through the maintenance therapy, about two years. Medication alone account for 77.6%. Unfortunately, national health insurance does not cover therapy. Globally, acute lymphoblastic leukemia therapy is not cheap. The bulk of the expenses are spent on cytotoxic drugs and hospital admission. However, 
in many of these other countries, the funding is borne by the health insurance. In Finland and Netherlands, AL therapy per patient costs on the average $100,000. And in the developing countries, like Shanghai in China, about $11,000. In Iran, $6,000. In Bangladesh, $4,000. I don't no insurance in Bangladesh. So what you are saying is that if you look at the cost for developing country, it's no different from our own experience in Nigeria. So medications. Cytoxan 500 milligram, we will need in all 14 vials, which per patient, please. This will be about 13,300 Naira. One Naira, one dollar will less exchange for 390 Naira. On COVID, 30,000 Naira per patient. Metotrexate, 44,000 per patient. Satosin arabinoside, 225,000 Naira per patient. Doxorubicin, 67,000 per patient. Sismacaptopurin, 199,000 Naira per patient. And asparaginate is the most expensive, nearly a million per patient. So subtotal per drugs is $4,089. Total for 100 patients that we envisage to study is $408,025 for the whole patient. If you look at the cost of investigations, Complete block count, 4,000 in all per patient. Cytochemistry, 20,000. Biochemical investigations, 12,000. Radio diagnostics, 8,500 per patient. Molecular screening. BCR, ABL1, using reverse transcriptase. We have this in our facility here. It's 50,000 per patient. Subtotal is 24,294 dollars for all the patients. We are using, we hope to, we have built into the proposal a query flow cytometer with the following primary antibodies, CD3, CD2, CD10, CD19, anti-CD20, anti-CD22, CD34, anti CD45, 79A, HLADR, and TDT. And the cost of this is US dollar 51,641 dollars. We will prefer to get the flow cytometer because. because it is important that we also have infrastructural development. Although these facilities can also be explored outside, in our outside laboratories, but we would rather prefer that we conduct these investigations in-house. Hospitalization for the 26-week period 
of induction is 364,000 naira per patient. That is about, that, this will be about $100,000. Okay. Hospitalization cost for for hundred patient thirty six million naira. Conferences, meetings, and sundry expenses just five thousand five million naira. We have here the summary of requirements for clinical trials. Equipment. 51.641,000 dollars. Medications, 408.025 dollars. Hospitalization, 93.33 dollars, thousand dollars. Investigations, 24.294 thousand dollars. Giving us a, a total of 578.755 dollars for the old, for clinical trial alone. So when we look at the old summary. Institutional charges, $57,473,000. Meetings and conferences, $12,820. The grand total, $648,000. So in effect, it's big money for the population. But there is a very strong need to carry out this proposal. Because ALL is potentially curable and we need to really establish it. It's a shame that as Dr. Adifenti showed in his presentation, we made a diagnosis and more than half could not be treated. And those who stayed behind to be enrolled will also not complete therapy before leaving the trial. And all because of the very heavy cost of chemotherapy. i like to thank colleagues in pediatrics and child health, Adifenti, Brown, Adeodo, staff, resident staff, and nursing officers. Police in hematology, Dr. Bola Niwa, Oju Ibe, Fashola in Ibadan, Olaniyi, resident staff, and others. So thank you for your understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Drosimi, uh, for this very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, I personally enjoyed it very much. I don't think that we have any question uh, from outside, which is a little bit uh, discouraging for me. Uh, but if I may just uh, make some comments. Yeah. I agree that looking at the budget that you presented, uh, the average uh, person in Africa and in Nigeria in particular, I uh, would be uh, almost shell shocked to so, say, oh, this is a lot of money. But, you know, I have well, taken the uh, uh, liberty of sharing your budget with people here at the University of Washington here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, and their overall impression is that this is a very modest estimate. And this is very reasonable and, uh, and modest. Uh, I have a son uh, in New York City who is uh, an associate professor 
uh, and doing a lot of research. And he said, uh, Dad, uh, this study is so modest that, I mean, people, potential funders, would uh, you know not want to fund it because it is too modest, and they will they say, well, maybe you wouldn't have enough uh, useful information. Uh, you should make a bigger study. Uh, which I said, no, we will do what the uh, Nigerian uh, uh, investigators want. Uh, this is uh, to cut a long story short. I think you should not feel like you're doing anything that is unreasonably uh, high. I think this study has the potential of making a very significant imp uh, impact, not only in, uh, in, in terms of uh, improving survival of the patient, but actually uh, making it possible for you guys to learn how to work together. And I'm very, very encouraged. Uh, uh, by these uh, three uh, presentations because it tells, it shows me that it is possible to get Africans and African scientists, medical scientists, uh, working together to uh, uh, resolve uh, medical problems. So uh, having said that, I, I would want to suggest that uh, it is reasonable to have uh, the uh, immunophenotypic uh, studies carried out in-house rather than commercially, because this is research. Uh, we would be able to train people, this, uh, you know, uh, capacity building uh, among uh, your residents and your students uh, will be possible when you do this uh, studies in-house and you would know exactly what you're doing and how to interpret the data. So I think uh, we should, we have to double our effort in finding uh, the necessary uh, amount of money uh, to make sure that this study uh, is carried out both in terms of clinical uh, care as well as laboratory. Any questions that you want to ask me, I'm uh, open to try to uh, have further discussions with you. We still have uh, more than 30 minutes at our disposal. Anybody with comments or questions? So I was going to ask uh, Professor Drosimi, uh, the institutional charges, uh, which is about $57,000, would this just be for IFE or I mean for you know, the facilities in IFE uh, or IFE Anibado? Okay. The institutional. I think we have. Yeah, I think we have to build it by into it as well, because this is just ten percent that hospital in here in Ife. I think we will have to build that of Ibado into it, and maybe we can also make requests add additional accurate flow cytometer. But when we are preparing this proposal, we are looking at the budget, the, the government debt fund can afford. So we cut down on a lot of things. I think we should be able to add the button, get an extra flow cytometer, and also include the institutional charges for Ibado. Okay, so it sounds to me like you need to revise your budget. Uh, I think we need to do that. Yeah, I think you, uh, now, if it's uh, in my view, I mean, I, I've been away from Nigeria now more than uh, 20 years. So I don't know what, uh, how, what the population is like now, but uh, the population of Ibadan is so enormous 
I, you know, I, I think that you need to modify your uh, uh, budget to include uh, performance of this study also in Ibada. <clears throat> And it seems to me that uh, if, if you can have two uh, uh, accurate flow cytometer, uh, one in the pattern and one in uh, IFRA, it's uh, yes. much, much better than just having one uh, okay. in, uh, in, uh, in IFRA. But I, I think we just have to, you know, um, also with it, so, it seems to me that the entire budget as presented is only for IFE, right? And you uh, uh, project no, the, the, no, sorry, the drugs cover all, both Ibado and IFE. Oh, I see what you mean, okay. Oh, the but drugs cover both Ibado and IFE. Okay, but the laboratory studies are only for IFE, is that correct? No, sorry, the drugs and investigations Full, full blood count, yeah. biochemistry, radiology cover both Ibado and Ife. Okay. But the institutional charges and flow cytometer are built into, I mean, uh, only for Ife. Oh, yeah. My guess is that Ibado is going to ins uh, uh, insist on having their own uh, cut. Uh, also, because you cannot be having uh, the institutional charges only in IFE and not in Ibadan. Uh, I agree. So I, I think that you may need to revise the... The, uh, the budget, the, yes. Yeah. Now, having said that, I, I, I remain very committed to your study. Okay, I, okay. I am looking around for money. Thank you. Uh, there are signs that I may be able to find something, but I'll keep you informed. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that is a very important study, uh, not only uh, important for the <laughs> I, I think there is a potential that you may even have the global impact uh, if the study is well done. And I'm very encouraged uh, listening to uh, uh, Dr. Adi okay, and Brown and yourself. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, there is a, a potential uh, for a good outcome. So, um, now, what else was I going to say? Any other person had? Oh, I think there is a question here. Let me see. Uh, uh, there is a question from uh, Dr. Kimutai. It says, regarding budget for drugs, uh, e.g. even Christian, are these prices based on retail or subsidized? Please show slide again. I agree, budgets appeared modest. Okay, Dr. Josie, me, that's for you. Retail. Yes, it's retail. It's not subsidized. And we are using WHO essential cytotoxic drugs. Yeah. And he's, he's saying that he would like to see the slide again. Is there any way you can let him see the slide again? Oh, okay, it's shown again here. Yeah. So, Dr. Ki uh, Kimutai, I, I hope you are seeing uh, the slide. Uh, I don't know if, if you have any education to put in put the follow comments in the uh, Q and A uh, bubble. Oh, education. Uh, uh, Dr. Kimutai is following you on uh, uh, following your slides. So if you could okay. just slowly show him the, the, the various slides with the... Uh, uh -huh, okay. Yeah. So because I think he's, he's viewing it and he's saying that it looks okay. okay. So just let him see the slides again. Okay. Asparaginase is the most expensive of the medications. Yeah, yeah. It has always been. Uh, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, Ella's prejudice was used even during my own training uh, as a medical oncologist in, this, in the 70s. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Yeah. So, and uh, now the other thing I observed in this presentation, especially from uh, Dr. Uh, Defendi, 
uh, talking about uh, uh, the methotrexate protocol. Uh, okay. I had the same problem back in 1978 when I got to Ibadan. And, uh, and I wanted to use high dose, uh, uh, high dose methotrexate. Uh, to treat uh, uh, patients with acute with a uh, bucket lymphoma. Bucket okay, lymphoma. Exactly. Yes. And uh, I, I I had to give up the idea because we did not have uh, the facilities for monitoring the uh, uh, blood level of methotrexate. I had done a lot of uh, uh, studies uh, in in New York City before coming to about uh, about the toxicity of uh, high dose methotrexate. And so that was why I, I decided to go for high dose uh, 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 and uh, and it's it's very interesting that uh, almost fifty years after that you still have the same problem. <laughs> in it's the same. It's unfortunate. It is. It is. It's, I, I think we are, Africa need. We need to do something to bring to move Africa forward. Yeah. But as I said again, uh, I, I am very, very uh, uh, impressed by uh, the three presentations. I, I, I believe that uh, things can happen. Now, the other one question I would have, how do you intend to um, monitor your patients? Uh, these patients, uh, the, the induction phases are going to be carried out as inpatients, I guess. Uh, yes. And uh, what what kind what what is this you know the nursing staff uh, like that you're going to use for this study? Are you going to train your, your nurses to be able to observe patients? I'm saying this because of my experience, uh, my uh, my early days in Ibadan, uh, where I you know at times I've just be around in and uh, get to the ward and I. But you know, a patient who was doing well 24 hours earlier will be dead overnight. And you say, well, what happened? And you say, oh, well, he was vomiting or, or he had a little fever. And uh, so you would need to train your nurses uh, about observing these patients because you had, uh, the, the, the protocol you're using is not an easy protocol. It is tough. It is toxic, and uh, even if you have uh, GCSF, you are still going to run into problems. So you need to you have, uh, uh, you know, your nursing staff with special training. So what kind of uh, program do you have to train your nursing staff to be able to give you uh, the necessary uh, uh, support in the management of your patients? I think we are going to take extra care because these cases will not be the first cases of uh, mal malignancies to, to manage. It's not new, but we will take adequate care to ensure that patients are properly uh, monitored. Monitored, yeah. Very good. Is Professor Brown still on the line? Oh, maybe he left. Okay, any other questions with any anybody else with uh, comments? I want I'm on, I'm on the line. Oh, you are on? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. So, no, I, I was going to ask, uh, you know, because it, from the description of uh, the uh, laboratory procedures, it sounded like you are going to be here. Uh, uh, well, you are in Ibadan, right? Yes, sir. And, uh, and uh, Professor Drusim is in Ife. Yes, sir. And uh, so I'm just wondering how you guys are going to coordinate. You, you certainly need an Asurim, uh, uh, you know, flow cytometer in, in, in Ibadan. Yes, sir. You? Yes, sir, we do. Okay. We, so, we have two hematologists in the team, Dr. Olani and Dr. Pashola. Yes. And Dr. Olani has been trained on flow cytometry. So I think oh, that. Okay, okay, okay. This, that, this that, is very, that is a very yes. important thing. He may just go to Ife for a refresher and then. 
Right. This goes with it in a battle. Right. You know, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, being a devil's advocate here, uh, but uh, you know, when we were in Ibadan, of course, there was nothing like flow cytometry. There, there, uh, and uh, what we just did was to use, uh, I don't remember, so, uh, uh, some of this uh, special microscopy. I, I, I've forgotten the name of my uh, technician. Uh, uh, Dr. Drosim, do you remember the name of my technician? It's not Salio, no, it's not. Salio, that's right, Salio. Yeah. So, you know, but of course, I don't think Salio well, is, is probably retired or something. Uh, yes, retired. Right, you know, but if Sally is still around, you can get him uh, just to give you some ideas about what used to happen, because he did a, a, a very, very good work in, in my lab, and uh, we didn't have slope flow cytometry. You wouldn't believe it uh, uh, for uh, uh, even a phenotyping, uh, like recognizing T, t cells, we, we even used, uh, you know, the ship, uh, red blood cell uh, uh, rosette formation as part of our, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, as part of our study. Um, uh, but, uh, and again, the, the monoclonal antibodies that we used were the very first generation of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and uh, so all these CD10, CD20 that you're talking about, we had different names for them. We were using the J5, uh, which was, stands for uh, 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 an antibody that was created at Harvard University by an individual by the name Jerome, and uh, and uh, OKT3, OKT4. Of course, all those things are now have been converted to CDs. Amino so, is um, now readily available. Sorry, please. I said monoclonal antibodies for immunocytochemistry yes. are now readily available. And they are now available, right? They are now available. In, okay, that's good. But you must pay for them. Oh, yeah, sure, of course. Yes. Uh, in those days, I mean, we did, our study was done as part of an international study, and uh, all, 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 all the samples were provided to us from London, England. And, oh. uh, and so we didn't have any. As I said earlier, these were the first generation of monoclonal antibodies. And so uh, on the whole, I think uh, I've enjoyed your presentations very much. And uh, I think we just, uh, any, other, any, any other person out there with questions for us or comments? If not, I think we'll just uh, close this session and uh, we will meet again in about uh, four weeks time for uh, session uh, three. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.